What's up everybody, coming to you in a slightly different format because I'm a little pinched for time, but I wanted to make sure I got this video out there for y'all to see. One of the projects that I've been working on recently is I've been working on automating a Dell power switch device running operating system six, Dell OS six. And what I wanted to do was use Pi ATS in order to actually run parsers. Let me show you real quick. If I bring up the terminal from my Dell OS six appliance, uh, one of the things you'll see is that the Dell OS six, it doesn't really support things like, I already got to type my password. Here we go. <laughs> there we go. One of the things is, is Dell OS six appliances are CLI based appliances. They don't have an API. They don't have NetConf or so anything like that. Uh, so this is where Pi ATS could really come into play and help us develop automating solutions for platforms like Dell's power switch appliances. We can build parsers that actually allow us to parse this output and turn it into structured data. And that's what I've been doing. So let me introduce you real quick to what is going on here uh, and how you can get started working on this too. There are a couple ways that we need to actually use Pi ATS to actually perform parsing output. The first one is we have to build the actual connection uh, to the Dell OS 6, the actual driver that logs in and can figure out where in the CLI it is. It can actually look at, say, uh, the command line. Let me bring it back up. And it can see whether or not it's in the user mode, or it can see if it's in privilege mode, or it can see if it's in configuration mode. That's We have to actually build the mechanism that can connect in and figure out where it is uh, and navigate between tiers and actually issue commands. And this is what Pi ATS calls the Unicon. This is a pluggable solution so that way you can develop your own connectors and uh, just, you know, upfront, like you have to have pretty solid uh, Python skills in order to do this. So if I'm on github.com, Cisco test automation, here we are, it's github.com slash Cisco test automation. Uh, I can go into unicon.plugins and this is where you'll be able to actually build the connector plugin, which SSH is into devices and uh, can navigate through the CLI and execute commands. The good news is, is that most of the heavy lifting is already done. So actually, let me just show you real quick. From the basic repo here, I can click on source Unicon plugins and you see the list of devices that are supported. Um, for the most part, you see like things like iOS, iOS XE, iOS XR, all of these inherit from these this generic folder and all of these uh, classes and functions that are in the generic folder. So most of the heavy lifting is actually handled by you and you just end up tweaking uh, your connector plugin to work with that. And I'm gonna talk about that as we get into the actual code itself. Jumping back to Cisco test automation, once you actually have the Unicon plugin in place and you can connect into your device, then it's time to actually create the parsers themselves. So from Cisco test automation, I keep jumping ahead. There's the Genie parser section here, and this is where the actual parsers are written. So here you see source or SRC slash Genie. You'll give that a click. You'll go into libs and then parser. And then you see the list of parser appliances that are here. So we can take a look at something like iOS and you see each of the commands that they've built the parsers for, right? Let's pick on something like show rip. And actually that's, it's pretty basic. <laughs> Let's go back and pick on something a little more uh, in depth. How about show interface? That's going to be a good one. Yeah, here we go. Lots of classes here. Um, in fact, it looks like it actually inherits uh, its configuration from show interfaces iOS XE, so that's another bad example. <laughs> we'll find a good one here, I promise. Uh, show spanning tree? Nope, still inheriting. Okay, well, we'll get to it. Don't worry about it. Parsers, are, this is where this comes in. So when you want to build your own plugin or your own parser, uh, this is this is going to be your starting point is github.com slash Cisco test automation. So the way this works is you basically clone these repositories to your own GitHub account, and then you can make changes on your own account, and then you ask them to pull your changes in. And that's what I've done with Unicon at least. So let's take Unicon for example. We go into Unicon, and then up here in the top right example, you see a fork button. When you click that, it takes a copy of it from Cisco test automation and puts it on your own account. You have forked the code. And now you can make changes to it on your own account. And when you're done, you create a pull request to ask them to pull your changes back into the main. So if we actually go to my account real quick, I'll go to github.com 
slash data Knox. I'll go into my repositories. You see, I've got Unicon plugins and Genie Parser already here. It's because I forked it. And it says right here in the little text, uh, forked from, oh, let me hit back because that was a link. Uh, it says forked from Cisco Test Automation Unicon plugins and forked from Cisco Test Automation Genie Parser. So when I go into Unicon plugins now, and I go into source Unicon plugins, now we see my Dell OS 6 folder here and the scripts and code that I writ, wrote to make the Unicom plugin for Dell OS 6. Uh, if you click on it, you can see this is where I wrote it. I put my little author there section. Um, largely inspired by the Unicon plugin example. So uh, now's where we're going to actually get into the, the, we've talked about what we're going to do, where I was creating the Dell uh, OS 6 Unicom plugin as well as parsers. Now we're actually going to get into how you can do it too. First things first, I use the PyATS Docker container for my development. If you watch other people's guides or read through documentation, they'll tell you to use a virtual environment. I absolutely could not get that to work uh, on both Windows or WSL. Um, inexplicable why. Uh, so I just did it all in a Docker container. So without further ado, I'll bring up a terminal. And we will say, we're actually just going to copy this right here, this docker pull command right there. Pull command copied, Windows terminal, and pull it. So it's going to download this docker container. Um, finds out that a lot of it already exists, which is pretty cool. Um, this is going to get the latest version of it. And there we go. So it is now pulled. So here's what I am going to do. We're going to say docker run. I'm going to say I want it detached and interactive. That way VS Code can connect to it and we can do our automation and work with it there. Uh, we'll say, I'm going to give it a name. We'll call it like mm, PyATS Dev. And then we will run this container here. I'm going to copy it and paste it. Cisco Test Automation PyATS Late. And I'm going to tell it enter in the bash mode. So I press enter there, and now the container's up and running. So we got a little bit of work to do now to uh, set up this environment. At this point, once you've run the Docker container, you want to go to GitHub and fork either the Genie parsers or Unicon or both, whatever you want to develop on. If you want to work on only parsers and you don't want to work on connections, you don't need to work. You don't need to fork Unicon. Unicon is only when you want to create a new connector into a new platform. Uh, if you only want to work on parsers, you only need to fork the Cisco Test Automation Genie Parsers repo. So uh, that's what I've done. I've forked both of them here. So now that my container is up and running, I'm going to fire up VS Code. I'm going to click in the bottom left corner, and I'm going to choose Attach to a Running Container. And there's PyATS Dev right there. So this fires up a new instance of VS Code. And in the bottom left corner, I see I'm attached to it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my terminal and give it a print working directory. It has me in root. So I'm going to CD out of that into the, uh, the actual root folder. And over here on the right hand side, I'm going to choose to open a folder. And actually, I'm going to delete this out here. I'm not going to do root. See, I've got just forward slash at this point. I'm going to go into PyATS and click OK. So over here on the right hand side, I see PyATS fires up and running. Uh, this is the actual PyATS code um, that is going to execute the actual like raw PyATS work. So in terminal, I'm going to fire up a new terminal again. I now see I'm in PyATS. Uh, here's the thing, PyATS in this container runs in a virtual environment. So the first thing I need to do is go source bin activate. And now I'm in the PyATS virtual environment, which actually has PyATS running in it. So the idea now is that we are going to be able to pull down our repos that we forked. And when we make changes to it, we can override the PyATS environment. So here's the next thing. This PyATS container is running py the container image of Python 3.6 Lite. Uh, so that means it doesn't have git installed and it doesn't have make installed. So we need to get that. So let's give it an apt update. There we go. Now I'm going to say apt install git. And I'm going to say yes to install git. I'm also going to say apt install make. M-A-K-E. There we go. So now we have both of these. Now in this PyATS folder, I'm going to make a directory. Uh, I'm just going to call it working. So it's going to be my working folder. Now I'm going to change into working. And here's where I'm going to clone the two repos that I created earlier. I'm going to jump back to GitHub real quick. 
I'm first going to copy the genie parsers. So I copy the URL right here. I jump back to VS Code and I say git clone. And there we go. It's cloning the genie parsers right now. And there we go. Now I'm going to clone the Unicon repo, which is on my side. And clone this. Again, this is my repository, not Cisco's repository, after I have forked their code. So there we go. Now it's going to clone Unicon. So if I give it an LS, I see I've got the Genie Parser and Unicon plugins. And now uh, over here, I see my working folder. I see the Genie Parsers and I see Unicon plugins. Let's start with Unicon plugins. Uh, for this, I'm actually going to close the terminal and we're going to navigate from Unicon plugins into source and then into Dell OS 6. And we need to talk about these uh, in a lot of detail. This is honestly the hardest part of the whole thing if you're making a Unicon plugin. Um, this, is, this is pretty challenging. Remember that the big thing that you're doing for the most part is you're going to be inheriting from other plugins, particularly the generic plugin. Also, because Dell OS 6 is so incredibly similar to iOS, uh, I, in some cases, inherited directly from the iOS V plugins. Um, so let's start with the init file. The init file is mandatory. All of these files are mandatory that I'm about to show you. Uh, init is mandatory, and this is what initializes the plugin. Now here you can see I am inheriting from the iOS V single RP connection, basically a single routing plane or um, not a dual head uh, connection, not like a master chassis or anything like that. Um, this, for the most part, there's not a whole lot to it. I just identify the OS by name, OS 6, and I import a bunch of stuff from the other files. So my recommendation to you is when you create your new folder for Unicon, create all of the files, even if they're empty. Create init, patterns, services, settings, state machine, and statements. Uh, and then, honestly, my, my recommendation to you is just copy and paste like my code here in each of these files and then edit them as needed. <laughs> um, so the init file is what initializes this, uh, this class um, or these classes and the connection itself. There's really not much to it. We're importing the state machine, which we're gonna talk about. We import the service list, which we're gonna talk about. We import settings, which we're gonna talk about. The rest of it is basically inherited from how iOS V is imported. Patterns. This is where we set up how it is able to determine where it is on the CLI. It's able to determine if we're being prompted for a login. It's able to determine if we're in user mode. It's able to determine if we're in privilege mode. It's able to determine if we're in, in a config mode. And that's like config, config interface, config VLAN. Uh, beyond that, it's able to determine, I had to add this one in here. So I had to edit a lot of these, and I also had to add password in here, uh, because when, you may have noticed this already, when you go into privilege mode right here, I typed enable, it prompts right here for password colon. That's what comes up on the field. Uh, and this is why Dell OS 6 this is one of the reasons why I had to create a new Unicon plugin. Um, so this just sets up the actual regex expressions for identifying these patterns. Uh, other files here are what uses them. Services, I don't really understand what's going on here. Full disclosure, uh, I know that this is how it tells the Dell OS device uh, to execute commands. For the most part, I copied and pasted this. <laughs> Full disclosure, uh, there's just not a whole lot. Uh, I, you can see actually right here, like in the in the top, I said contents largely inspired by the sample Unicon repo. They do have uh, a sample Unicon repo where you can see like how to build your own plugins. It has a lot more comments uh, in the text on how to do it. Really, for the most part here, where it said things like iOS V, um, you can see I, I'm again inheriting a lot from iOS V. Down here, the very bottom, basically um, where it said iOS in the functions themselves. So right here on line 39, I changed this to be return Dell OS times three. <laughs> and then on the very last line right here, uh, I identified that it is initiating the Dell OS service. That's all I got for you on this one. <laughs> I know this is an important file, uh, but I just, there wasn't a lot for me to edit. And there you have it. Settings, this is an important file. This is where when it gets connected, 
it SSHs in, under the hood, when it SSHs in, it enters a series of commands. So in this case, in my case, it enters terminal length zero. If you were to just like inherit from the generic class and not change anything, it would try and do terminal width zero. Uh, it would try to go into configuration mode. That's what HA init config commands does. So you, you see we've got the init exec commands in exec in privilege mode. It's going to execute these commands to set up the session before it sends in like your CLI commands or your parser commands that you want. So terminal length zero, that means we don't want it to have prompt for more. We don't want paging. We want it to just send the whole thing. Um, and that's that's what terminal length zero does. Uh, there is no terminal with zero on Dell. And there is no line VTY04. And there is no exec timeout command. So uh, I had to change these in the Dell OS settings to work there. The state machine, this is how it identifies. It uses those patterns that we talked about earlier. Or no, excuse me, That's we're not there yet. This is how it identifies when it should move from like ROM on to enable mode. It should move from disable mode to enable mode. This is how it determines uh, what paths it should move through. And the big one to look at that I did here is disable to enable. That's user, user mode to privilege mode. We identify that it's moving from a path of enable or of disable to the enable state with the enable word and then we're expecting a dialogue to prompt with a password statement. So the password statement says when we see the prompt, uh, we're going to give it some commands to issue, and that's what comes up in the statements file. I know, see, it's already, like, we've gone down quite a rabbit hole. And you also notice this is inheriting uh, even more configurations from the generic RP state machine. So it's going to be trying to do a whole bunch of stuff when you look in the generic RP state machine. Look at, this is generic RP state machine. From here, it inherits from state machine, uh, which comes from an even different place. It, you, you end up going down a rabbit hole when you try and find out where all this stuff is. Long story short, let's get back to where we are on statements. So statements. This is where I had to tell it when you get prompted for the enable password, right down here, when you see the pattern of password, Jumping back to patterns, here's the pattern of password right there. It's just password. Let's jump back to statements. When you see the pattern of password, the action is to run the enable password handler function. Now, this is code that I copied and pasted uh, from the generic section. Um, but here is the enable password handler where it sends in the enable password. It calls the get enable credential password function, which is where it actually parses through your test bed to find your enable password. So that's the function that gets run here and that's how it gets logged in using the enable password. Totally honest with you here, when you build your own Unicon, um, you're probably gonna end up like copying and pasting my code or copying and pasting from IOSV. You're gonna run it, it's not gonna work. You're gonna do some troubleshooting. Um, the number one troubleshooting thing that I ran into is something that I should have already known. The host name in the testbed file must exactly match the host name of the device itself. It must exactly match, including case sensitive. Uh, I ran into that issue. Uh, I had to fix the host name in my testbed file. And then I started getting, you know, errors. I got, you know, hung up on the password statement. Um, and I was able to just control C to cancel it and look at the stack trace and see where it broke. And then I just kind of went down the rabbit hole fixing one piece at a time until I got this to work. So that is how the Unicon structure works. One last thing with Unicon. Uh, if you look over here in the folder structure, down here underneath Windows, there is an init, and you want to make sure you tack yours on, your supported OS, uh, to the init file there. So uh, at this point, I've made all of my changes here to the code. I go to GitHub, and I push uh, my code into the actual repository itself, back into GitHub. So here I am, I'm back in my code. Um, and this is the data Knox Unicom plugins. From here, I can go to pull request. If I do no, new pull request right here, notice it automatically detects the base repository was from Cisco Test Automation, and it shows me what all has changed and what all I've added to this repo. 
From here, you click view pull request and it will actually tell you if there's any conflicts. Right here, you can see it tells you it's able to merge. And then you add comments in to your pull request telling them why Cisco should pull your changes into the Unicon repo. So that sets up the Unicon connection. And at this point, uh, you're done working on Unicon. Uh, it's time to move on to the parsers themselves. Real quick, if you want to find a quick way to get to the Unicon plugins, um, of course, it's in my code. You can also Google Unicon PyPy and it will have a link there. But yeah, this is the quick way to get there. Uh, it's right there. If you just look in my code in my repository in the comments, it's got this link right here and that'll get you there. Okay, now to the parser. This is the part you probably have been caring about. So under Genie Parsers, uh, I go to, where is it? Oh, source, SRC libs, parser, and now uh, you got to add your folder here. So I added Dell OS 6. So um, first thing is you need an init one more time, uh, init.py, and it needs to have this code in there from Genie import abstract, abstract declare token name. So you need to have that. Make sure you've got your init.py in your folder. Uh, if you're already working with like an existing platform like iOS XE, it's already going to be there. Don't worry about it. Um, so from here, uh, now we're going to do, we create our, our code. So there's really two components to building a parser. First of all, you have to have all of these from and import statements right here. And there's two components. The first one is the schema. So I'm trying to create a parser for the command show version here. So I create a class called show version schema and inherits from meta parser. Then I create a class called show version and it inherits from show version schema. So the schema uh, is what we're going to say the exact output should look like. Uh, we identify the keys right here, and then we identify what data type they should have. In my case, these are all strings. Um, if we look at other ones like show IP route, I identify a key of routes, then any which means this could be anything, the next key could be anything. We're gonna dynamically create that key on the fly. Uh, but you can see I've got string as a data type, Boolean as a data type, and integers as a data type here. So let's jump back to the show version. Uh, so this sets up the actual schema of what I should expect. Here's how I actually did this. I have saved the schema for last. Um, I created my parser first, which is, uh, oops, <laughs> which is what we did down here. Uh, and then I came back to it after the fact and created the schema. So that's what I'd recommend you do is start actually with the parser. So the first thing in the parser is we specify the CLI command that is going to actually be run uh, when the parser is called. So that is, the, that is the first thing you do is you set the CLI command. In the comments here, I actually put what the expected output should be, what the text should look like, and this is what we're going to do. The way this parser works, let me draw here, is it's going to issue this command, show version, and then it's going to loop over every line in the output, and it checks regex expressions to see if there's a match on this particular line. So if I actually scroll down just a hair, I jump up just a little bit, just gonna jump ahead just a little bit right here, you say four line in out split lines. Uh, basically that means four line that's in this output. It goes through and it says, okay, start with the P0 regex expression and see if there's a match on this line. Uh, if there's not a match, M remains null. So if there is a match, M will not remain null. So we then go in to the match and we say like, okay, we need to grab the machine description variable from that resulting set uh, and put it in my result dictionary that we're gonna be returning to Python. So this is kind of what, that's kind of just the flow of it. Now let's actually dig into it. So the first thing I'm trying to do is like, okay, I've got this machine description here. This is the line. And I wanna grab this chunk right here Dell networking switch, that's what I want to return uh, in my schema. So right here, I've got a schema called machine description, and I want that machine description to show me the value of Dell networking switch. So I have to create a regex that matches this. How do we do that? Because nobody's good at regex, right? We go to regex101.com, and here we go. So if I copy in this text output, right here, and I go back to this section, 
Let's just unindent this real quick. Okay. Now what you can do is you can see, I'm gonna copy this regex description, everything inside the quotes, don't copy the quotes if you're trying to work with regex101.com, and I'm gonna paste it in right here. So uh, you can see how this worked. This parentheses question mark P creates a variable inside these little bracket brace line things here called machine description. Then, since this is really the end of the line here, I just said match anything as repeating times because I want everything from the end of the line, from, from after this space, I want everything else uh, and put that in this machine description. So that way, when this regex expression runs, uh, it's gonna find, you know, starting with machine and then a space repeating as many times as we want, then description, then match on a period, repeating as many times as we want, that's all these periods, then a space, then I set up my variable to collect everything after the fact, and that's going to be Dell networking switch. Uh, and over here, you can see it's got the full match, it matched this line, and then it created the group match right here, it matched the machine description variable uh, to networking switch. The, the same thing kind of goes for any of these lines here. For instance, let's grab uh, the burned in address, the MAC address here. So if I grab this line right here, go back to regex 101, paste this in, you can see it jumps down here, and it kind of follows the exact same pattern again, where it matches burned in a space, in in a space, MAC in a space, address, uh, and then repeats as many times as we want, um, the periods, and then a space, and then everything after the space uh, is the burned in address. So this is how uh, you set up your regex expressions uh, and kind of use a regex cheat sheet. I'm not good at regex, I use a regex cheat sheet. The big thing here is just keep in mind that this parentheses question mark P is what creates your variable uh, that it's going to be looking for. And then within the parentheses, whatever comes after this little brace, that's what it's trying to match on for that variable. So all of these things we have uh, for each one of these lines in this output where there's data that I care about, I created a regex expression. Then it loops over each line and it tries to match that regex expression. And if there's a match, we use the group dict uh, little parser function method thing here and specify the key that we're looking for. Uh, so in this case, P0 was matching machine description. And when it matches, it's going to be holding that machine description value in M, that group dict, machine description. Now this line right here on 100 to 101, uh, this is if version is not in version dict. You see I created a version dict and a result dict. Uh, what that does is this version dict dot set default version with an open dictionary, that creates this first key of version with an open dictionary. The result dict after that is everything contained within version. So when you look at these parsers down here, you see all of these things are setting result dict machine description, result dict model, result dict machine type. Uh, that result dict is everything contained within version. Uh, and I'm just setting the keys here. So that's how uh, I created the parser with uh, starting off with the version key. So the same drill here again is, is once you're done creating your parser, there's, there's a couple things you need to do. Uh, you need to go into the change log and go into undistributed. And you can see uh, here's where we can go ahead and add just a change log about what we've made. So if I take a look here, uh, it's pretty straightforward, the format. They all look like this. See? We just say what the vendor is that we're doing. In my case, it would be Dell OS 6. We have a small description. Did we add something? Did we change something? And then what is the actual change itself or the addition that we've done here? So add your change logs in. Then once it's all done, you commit it back to GitHub, back up here. Oh, did I close out of GitHub? GitHub. And you go back into your repositories and you go into Genie Parser, and then you create another pull request. So there we go. Uh, here we go. I'm again able to merge. Uh, there's no conflicts. There's my code changes that are all listed here. Um, <laughs> make sure you take your test bed out if you've accidentally got it in the same repo. Uh, just take that out and send in uh, your pull request for your parser. So there you go. That's how I went about creating 
the Dell OS 6 Unicon plugin, as well as some Genie parsers. Let me know what y'all think if I need to go into more detail on this um, or if that was sufficient enough to get you started. Um, yeah, there you go.